I'm Jonathan Mosen. Coming up in episode 47 of Mosen at Large, historically the word blind has been used to mean a lot more than the absence of sight. Is that okay? What's your favorite Bluetooth keyboard? Some listeners have their say. We'd like to hear about yours. And would you buy an iPhone without a charger? Mosen at Large Podcast. You're very welcome to contribute to the podcast, and there are two ways to do it. You can drop me an email to jonathan, that's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, at mushroomfm.com. You can write something in that email, or you can attach an audio recording using anything that records and that you can attach to an email. You can also call the listener line. That number is in the United States. It's 864-60-MOSIN, 864-606-6736, and record a message that could be included in the podcast. Concise contributions always help. We can't include everything because of the volume of contributions we receive. And please note that if we do use your content, we reserve the right to edit it for clarity and brevity. You can follow Mosin at Large, all one word, on Twitter to join the conversation with other listeners, to get sneak peeks about what's coming up on the podcast. And I regularly tweet links that I think will be of interest to Mosin at Large listeners. To keep up to date with Mosin at Large and radio-related activities I'm doing, you can subscribe to our media email list. It's announcements only, and the traffic is very light. To do that, send a blank email to media-subscribe at mosin.org. That's media-subscribe at mosin.org. The podcast version of this show contains extracts from the full version, which is heard live on Mushroom FM at mushroomfm.com and anywhere that you listen to radio stations at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time on a Saturday afternoon. For the full Mosin at Large experience, I encourage you to be part of that community. And finally, before we get into the episode this week, a reminder that this podcast is long, and to help you navigate past the bits that you aren't interested in to the bits that you are, it's segmented by chapters. If you have a podcast app capable of supporting chapters, and many on iOS and Android do this, you can skip between segments of the show. I'm pleased to say we had a lot of great listener contributions and it was really hard to take too many out to try and make this podcast some sort of remotely reasonable length. So what I'm going to do is create a separate episode later in the week that has a couple of extended features. One of them will be a look at Markdown, what it is, why you might be interested in coming to grips with it, and how I'm now using Markdown to create my documents no matter what device I'm working with, including the scratch pad on my Focus 40 Blue 5th generation, Ulysses, and even Microsoft Word, a lot more besides. We'll also have a look at Apple's optimized battery feature at the request of a listener. So expect that episode later in the week. In my never-ending desire to ensure that this show is not pigeonholed as just a technology podcast, I want to pose this question to you for your input. And if you have input to offer, you're welcome to be in touch. Jonathan at MushroomFM.com on the email with an audio attachment, or you can write something down. And of course, the listener line number 864-60-MOSIN, 864-606-6736 in the United States. My question for you is this. Do you personally find it offensive when people use the term blind as a synonym for ignorance, stupidity, or an inability to understand someone else's point of view? If so, why? And if not, why not? This is an issue about which I have strong opinions, and I've held them all my life. And sometimes I've been criticized for those opinions, which is absolutely fair enough. Healthy debate is a good thing. What I do find frustrating, though, is that often I'm criticized for my opinions by people who say no more than what politically correct nonsense. And that is just a cheap shot. It is lazy thinking. And I give that the contempt that it deserves, because essentially people use the term politically correct to be derisive of or dismissive of something that they personally disagree with. So you have to come up with something a little bit more robust than that, I'm afraid. Now. My opinion on this is that language evolves and changes over time. For example, thankfully, racial or homophobic slurs that would have been acceptable even 50 or 60 years ago, even though they hurt those affected, are now rightly confined to the dustbin of history. And ableist language should go the same way. So I am firmly of the view that using blind as a synonym for stupid or ignorant or intolerant is counterproductive to the advancement of blind people. 
and I'm going to give you my reasons why. First, blindness is a very low incidence population. So when you meet someone for the first time, you might be the first blind person that they have really sat down and got up close with and had a conversation with. Couple that with the fact that sight is an incredibly dominant sense. If you possess it, you do receive a lot of your information through your eyes. There are all sorts of scientific studies that indicate the high percentage of information that people absorb through sight. So when you are so sight dependent, when you come across somebody who doesn't have that sight to depend on, it's natural to wonder how the heck does this person cope? How do they dress themselves and use a computer, let alone go out there and get a job? And I back that statement up by saying, look at the dire unemployment statistics in the blind community, far, far higher than any racial minority. There are several reasons for that, access to quality rehabilitation and education, but one of the big reasons is other people's attitudes. We are not going to change those attitudes if we keep allowing without protest the term blind to be used in those negative contexts. I actually took a broadcaster to the Broadcasting Standards Authority, which is the regulatory body that maintains broadcasting standards in New Zealand about, gosh, 20 odd years ago now. And I did it because an interviewer was speaking with a politician and the interviewer said, you would have to be blind to go into this not realizing it's a political minefield. When I complained to the Broadcasting Standards Authority, I said, for me, the test about whether that kind of language is appropriate or not is if you substituted the word blind for a word that would disparage the individual. So if the interviewer had said you would have to be stupid or you would have to be daft or you would have to be ignorant, the sentence would have still worked. In that kind of case, using the term blind is offensive and wrong, in my opinion. And by contrast, you have many people who think that talking about the word blind to describe someone like me who can't see a thing, not even light, is somehow an offensive term. We have allowed other people to hijack the word blind. And I believe it's time we really assert ourselves on this and make it stop. For me, the word blind is fine. I'm a blind person. I'm comfortable being a blind person. I consider it a characteristic that can be annoying at times. It certainly can be an impediment based on the way that society is structured, but the word blind is just fine. So we've got this warped society now where people are talking about the word blind in a pejorative sense to mean all sorts of negative characteristics, and yet they step around the real use of the word blind with bizarre terms like visually challenged or differently abled or whatever you want to use. So what do you think? Do you think that it matters that the term blind is being used in these negative ways that have absolutely nothing to do with the absence of physical sight? A view on this question from Tristan Clare in Australia. When I was a kid, I didn't mind the term blind being used as a substitute for ignorant, but there were reasons for this. Firstly, this was an era when the word normal was a perfectly acceptable word to describe able-bodied people. Both disability professionals and the general public used it. When I was transitioning from a blind school to my local primary school, I remember bragging to anyone who would listen that next year I would be going to a normal school. It was an era when we were less careful about language and knew less about the way it could impact public opinion in subtle ways. Also, I considered it as just one more of the many visual references with which the English language is peppered. I bet you've had the experience of someone you just met scrambling around trying not to say see, look, or any other words that refer to the sense of sight. It's pretty difficult to get through a conversation with someone without saying I watched this really great show, want me to look that up, or see you later. It's uncomfortable to witness the mental gymnastics people will go through in order not to mention the sense that must not be named. So I considered statements like, you must be blind when used to describe someone acting foolishly, as in the same vein, 
Nothing to get stressed about. Recently, I have had a change of heart. As I have had more experience of ableism and inaccessibility, both personally and vicariously, through the stories of friends and acquaintances, I can't deny my growing discomfort with the word I use to proudly identify myself being used as a casual pejorative. Just as the word normal is no longer used because it implies that able-bodied people are of more innate value than disabled people, I think people should just say ignorant or stupid when that's what they mean. Working eyeballs do not automatically confer good judgment. I have met many sighted people who aren't doing as well with the game of life as their blind contemporaries. Finally, if vegans are allowed to be offended by the phrase to flog a dead horse, then I'm allowed to take exception to the word blind being used outside the context of vision impairment. Pam Quinn writes, I've used the expression that a person would have to be deaf, dumb and blind myself, knowing that I don't mean it in a literal sense the way some people might. But when I think about it further, something I do object to is the expression that even a blind man can see that, such and such, or you would have to be blind not to see that. I remember a story that my mum told me shortly after I was born. She was with a group of friends, and one of them used the expression that someone was robbed blind. She said that when she looked over at him, he was hanging his head, aware of what he had said, and obviously thinking that she would have taken offence. I don't think she was offended, but she obviously never forgot it. And that is signed off by Pam from Hot Sunny, Iowa. An opposing point of view from Brian Gaff in the UK, who says, I am sure most people see the distinction between blind and being blind to something. It merely means that you have a kind of blind spot mentally to whatever it is. It's applying the concept, not the word. Harking back to an earlier discussion, I am really getting annoyed about various societies changing their name rather than including the word blind in the name. I do understand that many partially sighted people do not like being represented by an organization for the blind or of the blind, but sight loss is a continuum after all, and many people who have been partially sighted do become blind. It does not mean that all who can benefit are totally blind. Many people are still able to see if it's day or night, but have no useful sight. So calling yourself, for example, the Vision Foundation, where you used to be the Greater London Fund for the Blind, is more like some dodgy corporate realignment than anything else in my view. They could have easily made their name more modern without removing blind from it completely. Likewise, we have London Vision, which used to be something else. We have Sight for Surrey, which used to have blind in it as well, and so it goes on. I suspect it has more to do with trying to get funding than it does with the disgruntlement of the people they serve. And Peggy Kern on Twitter says, I'm not offended when blind is used as ignorance. We use deaf and crippled and other disability terms to mean things other than the disability. I guess my question for you is, does that necessarily make it right? Certainly in New Zealand, anyway, the term crippled is just frowned upon in general. Similarly, Holger is tweeting, no, words only become powerful if you give them power. As a minority, I'm concerned more about issues that affect those of us, such as violence and discrimination. I guess the point I'm making, though, is that I think that these words... The, the allowing of using the term blind to mean these inferior things actually perpetuates the discrimination. And I was hesitant about raising this question, but I do think it's relevant to refer people to Matthew. Yes, the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 14, I believe it is, which says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And when the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. I'm going from memory. I'm pretty sure that's an exact quote. So right from Sunday school, if people are being sent to Sunday school, they are getting this message that blind people shouldn't lead themselves. And we can say, oh, this is just a metaphorical analogy, all we want. But I must say, I've always been pretty impressed with 
the NFB and the way they have this feature, I think they still have this feature, that simply says, who are the blind who lead the blind? And I think it makes the point really well. We know, don't we, that when we as blind people speak for ourselves, good outcomes happen. When we take charge of our own destiny, that's self-determination. And that's something that racial minorities have fought for as well. Jonathan Mosin, Mosin at Large Podcast. Chances are if you're even tapping a little bit into technology news and social media discussion, you will have heard over the last week the rumor from a fairly reliable source usually that Apple's iPhone 12 is not going to include an iPhone charger in the box. Now, I suspect that the Pro version will, but they're suggesting that the iPhone 12 will not. There is, of course, a chance that this is all just a load of bunkum, mate. A load of bunkum. But it might be true, and particularly given this usually reliable source, we have to give some credence to this idea. If it is true, there are several reasons why it might be happening. First, there's the environmental argument. Apple might argue that a lot of us have iPhone chargers by now, and we don't need any more. My question would be, what about all the people they want to nab from Android, which is still the world's most dominant mobile operating system? It does seem crazy, really, especially since the cables that currently work with iPhone are proprietary. They are not USB-C. I can sort of get it if they were USB-C, but these are using Apple's proprietary lightning connection. The second reason could be they are softening you up for something that we talked about just a few short weeks ago and something I was actually quite surprised about in that not many people reacted to this. And this is the idea of a portless iPhone that doesn't have a port for the charger to plug into. So if you don't get a charger for your iPhone 12 when you don't have one lying around, then maybe Apple's thinking, oh, well, we'll probably go out and get a couple of wireless chargers because they're more convenient. So they're kind of softening you up. And then there are a couple of reasons on the Apple side why they think this might be a good idea. The first is that it lowers their cost of production. And when you have millions of units shipping, every little bit helps. So if you don't include a charger in every box, and they are also suggesting that there won't be any earbuds coming in the box either, then all that saving does really add up over this large number of units. And the second reason from the Apple side could be that because the box will be lighter, even though it's just a little bit lighter, again, that all adds up. It weighs less, so it costs less to ship, and there'll be savings. Now, it's not like Apple's strapped for cash, but anyway, This leaker is saying that you will be able to purchase a 20-watt adapter, which will charge your new shiny iPhone 12 with the 5G potentially very fast. So if you go and buy it, you'll get a good experience. But it seems extraordinary that when you buy a premium product, like an Apple product, that it might not even come with a charger in the box. You do wonder... How much are Apple fans willing to take? Will they roll over and just say, "Uh, yeah, I don't like it, but I'll buy the phone anyway? Or will they go elsewhere? Will there be some sort of rebellion? Apple got away with taking the headphone jack away, which inconvenienced many people. They have made other changes, which have had a short-term spike of huge unpopularity. But the Apple fans largely remain loyal. So what do you think? is the lack of a charger in the iPhone 12 box, if that's what happens, a deal breaker for you. Jonathan at mushroomfm.com, 864-60-MOSIN in the United States. Hello, Jonathan. My name is Anil. Here is my quick take on Apple not bundling charger with new iPhones. I think if they bundle a wireless charger with capable of charging at minimum 18 watt speed or higher i will say apple is going in a right direction instead they say without giving any charger and they say you get only the iphone when you buy it you have to buy your own charger then it is a good time to wait for a competitor (laughs) 
George Podcast. This email's come in from Colin Mowbray. He says blind people should adopt whatever strategy helps them in order to navigate their environment, so long as it's not offensive or antisocial, of course. I've often thought that some sort of clicker device could be useful and maybe not quite so weird as clicking your tongue or snapping your fingers. One strategy I used before adopting ultrasound sensors is the best solution. Incidentally, the K-Sona is made in New Zealand and is the best I've ever used. Is putting steel cleats under the heels of my shoes and you get constant feedback about your environment when walking on hard surfaces. But you need good, solid rubber heels for that. They've got short spikes on them, so you just hammer them on. One of my friends at blind school used to slap his toes on the ground when he walked, like he had a foot drop, and his mobility was better than that of any of us. He took over his family's farm, and, like the person you were remembering, used to ride his bike around the farm, Unrelatedly, he also became the master welder for repairing farm equipment in the local community, though I'll never know how he did that. Facial vision. It definitely is a thing. It is, of course, a misnomer. It does not involve the optic nerve, of course, but it is a clearly felt image on your forehead, eyelids and skin over the cheekbones. Some blind people are able to sense it, some aren't, but I don't think anyone's investigated possible explanations for this. You can sense lamp posts and bus stops and tall mailboxes when you come close enough, sometimes about four feet away, and estimate the size of vehicles parked on the side of the road, and it's easy to maintain your distance from a wall or thick hedge or solid fence when walking along beside one. However, objects need to be high enough to be sensed. I'm not sure, but I would guess they need to be over three feet high. It might vary from one person to another, I don't know. As for what it feels like, the only thing I can compare it to is therapeutic ultrasound, a treatment modality used by physios. I'm a physio. When we're treating hand pathologies or injuries, ultrasound therapy is often needed to mobilize tissues and help break up scarring inside and out. But it's hard to get even a small ultrasound head to maintain firm contact with the surfaces of fingers due to their size and shape, and good contact is essential. So we fill a long plastic basin with warm water and submerge the patient's arm and the ultrasound head. That way, you can target even the smallest and inaccessible areas, and the physio can put his other hand in the water to feel just how much turbulence the ultrasound head is producing and estimate the distance and intensity required to produce the effect he or she wants. Ultrasound transmitted through water feels like the image some people feel on their faces when sensing objects, though the ultrasound is stronger. As for explanations, my limited knowledge of fundamental physics only offers three possible theories. One, all matter vibrates. Atoms, molecules, and composite structures. Maybe we can feel that. Two, as most of us know, many objects and living things produce electromagnetic fields. We've all heard what happens when someone walks near a radio tuned to a weak FM signal. And some people are capable of stopping mechanical watches and clocks and, in rare cases, turn off street lamps and cause domestic appliances and TVs to malfunction. Maybe we can sense that. I'm pretty sure I can sense the electromagnetic activity of people who come close to me, like sitting beside me on a bus. 3. The ambient air is always moving to some degree. Maybe we can sense patterns of air currents or turbulence in the vicinity of objects of sufficient dimension. Lots of food for thought there. Thank you so much, Colin. Dan Teveld is here talking about the same subject. He says, Hi, Jonathan. I really enjoyed the discussion about echolocation on your latest podcast. I grew up on a farm and found it useful when I rode my bike on the parts of the farm where there was a road. I also found echolocation useful when I rode a horse. I could detect tree branches which horses love to go under, thinking they can throw their riders off. 
I don't remember anyone telling me not to use it. My family found it amusing and didn't make any trouble. Now I mostly use it when I'm walking with a cane. When I'm walking home, I can use it to locate my apartment entrance. In Austin, Texas, Kathy Blackburn says, I never heard a professional in the blindness field use the term facial vision. I suspect it had gone out of fashion by the time I was learning how to navigate. The only place I ever read the term facial vision was in an old juvenile fiction book called Follow My Leader. And it was by James D. Garfield. Copyright 1958. The main character loses his sight when another boy throws a firecracker in his face. A review of the book is beyond the scope of the question at hand, says Kathy. Suffice it to say that when I reread it as an adult, my reaction was far different from that of an 11-year-old. Hi, Jonathan. Andy Rebsher here. Just wanted to talk about a couple of things related to hearing... From a blind kid's perspective, wasn't it cool 50, 60 years ago when you could hear, like, everything? So, my parents encouraged me, actually, to use the old (coughs) to find things. Good old echo location. And on a totally different note, who could possibly forget that super high-frequency 15-point-something kilohertz sound that came out of an old CRT television? It used to annoy the living out of me, and I would uh, deliberately go in certain places in the room where it was nulled out or not as loud in order to not have to be subjected to it. So, thanks for the time to uh, make these remarks. Be well, good hearing you as always, and so long. Hello, Jonathan and everybody. This is Beth from Virginia Beach. Facial vision is definitely a thing. I've had it since I was a kid. When I had good hearing, which I no longer do, I lost 50% of it due to a virus symptomatically overnight about, what, eight years ago? Something like that. So now it, it has very much decreased. On the left side, I have none. It's the feeling, okay, how can I explain this? Try putting something right up to your face. And see if you don't, of course, you'll know you're doing it. But see if you don't feel something. And I don't mean touch your face with it. Even a piece of paper, something that's long enough and wide enough. It feels like there is a wall in front of you or in, you know, near, near that side. Like it used to be, I could pass something and go around it without hitting it with a cane if I was using one. I just knew it was there. I could feel it. It's as if it's, this is a really silly way to put it, but it's almost like there's an imprint on your face of something. I could even tell a car. And of course, I would tell by context what it was. It is a real thing. I used to hear it called facial vision, and I guess there's good reason for that because it's around your face. Wearing a mask, which I don't mind doing, does inhibit that on the right side, and it, it is disorienting. I never did anything with echolocation. I think his name is Daniel Kish. He could echolocate and ride his bike and everything, walk around without a cane or a dog or a human or anything like that for help. I never got into that. Carol Ashland has emailed in on the subject of blindisms. She says many, many blind people I knew as a child had the habit of putting their fingers in their eyes, including me. My eyes hurt terribly to the point that I pleaded with my ophthalmologist to remove them. He finally agreed to do so. After that surgery, I had no urge to put my fingers in my eyes. I know one other person who had the same result. I really believe that that habit was the result of eye discomfort, either eye pain or discomfort due to light. Regarding echolocation and facial vision, I think they are the same. Thank you, Carol. What an interesting thought regarding the prosthetic eyes versus real human eyes. Are there people who have had prosthetic eyes very early on in life? who, as a child, did the eye-poking thing. That'd be really interesting to know. Who's in at large podcast?
Pete writes, I heard some comment on the Suno band, and as I have one, thought I'd provide some details. First things first, the band is a great idea, and its inventors should be applauded for their hard work. It's not, by their own admission, a device you can just put on and have an instant result with. You do need to wear it for some time and experiment. The website provides some training you can undertake to familiarize yourself with the device, but really just using it is the best training. So now the downside. For me, the build quality is extremely poor. I got my first one in January 2019, and I am now on device number four. In each case, the device has failed just as I am getting back to using it and getting used to its feedback. One tip I'd suggest to anyone getting one is to have the spring-loaded bars which hold the strap on replaced with fixed ones or replace the whole strap. The sprung-loaded bars mean you hardly need to knock it and it falls off your wrist, often with the bar coming out. I am not aware of any waterproofing, but would suggest avoiding use in wet weather, as while I have never been told why I have had so many failures, I suspect the wet British climate might be a factor. If you can get past those, it really can help, especially with social distancing. I've heard one other podcaster comment that he found the feedback confusing when using his cane, and I'd say this can be true depending on where you are. It can also react to things you can't then find. However, when I am walking to my work, there are a number of delivery vehicles with back doors open. My cane just passes underneath, and this can mean I hit them before it touches them. The Suno band, however, gets these with plenty of room to spare. You just rotate your wrist slightly to find the clear space and move. It can also help to find doorways if you rotate your wrist to point it at a wall as you walk, and the vibration pattern will change if the doorway is open or recessed slightly. Not perfect, but can be helpful. He also writes, I am always interested to hear New Zealand's progress out of lockdown. As we have followed your model, I live in Guernsey in the Channel Islands, British Crown Dependency, not to be confused with the Californian ones. Oh, I know all about Guernsey because Lillian Bellamy used to live there. <laughs> we have now nearly reached two months of being completely free from the virus and have no internal restrictions. Off-island travel is, however, very restricted, with one flight a day to Southampton. If you do travel, you currently need to self-isolate for 14 days on return. They are going to try a seven-day model with a test on day seven, which will, they say, catch 80% of cases. I hope they are right, as if you test negative on day seven, you can have a relaxed quarantine for the remaining seven days. Good to hear from you, Pete, and thank you for the comments on the Sooner Band, which is most interesting. Yes, in New Zealand, what is happening is that people are, I guess, getting a little bit impatient. But the thing is, the restrictions are working. And when you look at the situations in many other countries, it sounds like you and I are in very good places to be right now. And I think it's just important that those leaders who have helped us to reach this position hold the line. Zach B has written in on the question of the charger. He says, hey, Jonathan, a quick update on the charger in the box situation in case you weren't aware. It sounds like a cool name for a mystery. The charger in the box. For those asking, by the way, yes, I think Apple is going to include the cable. What we're just talking about here is that what they call the charging brick. And I guess... A lot of us do have these charging bricks lurking about, whether they came from Apple or not. Anyway, Zach B, he continues, I'm pretty sure this is actually going to end up happening as Apple sent out a survey to a select group of iPhone users yesterday inquiring about how they use the charger that comes with the device. Yes, the fact that Apple's actually surveying, which is very unusual for Apple, you know, Steve Jobs would probably have been dead against this idea because he was firmly of the idea it's up to Apple to tell us what we want. It's up to Apple to make the case for the products that they have and take people with them. But under Tim Cook's regime, they're actually doing a bit of surveying. And I guess that suggests that they understand 
the potential nuclear nature of this suggestion. Zach continues, I hope they will just offer an option to have a charger included in the box at the time you purchase the phone. That way, it won't be such a slap in the face to people who are coming to the iPhone from Android. If they give you an option to tick a box, I would like a charger and they don't charge you extra for the charger, if that's not too confusing, then fair enough. Don't charge me for the charger, bro. But um, if they are going to um, charge you extra, then I think that's probably a little bit on the nose myself. A bit on the nose, particularly given all that Apple's earning. Jonathan, Nick Zamorelli here. My problem with hypersensitivity in the use of the word blind is that if you're going to change that, you also have to change my pet peeve, which I've mentioned to you before. Uh, I don't like the term visually impaired because to my mind, sight, eyesight, and vision are two different things. Eyesight uh, obviously comes from the eyes, right? So if somebody is sight impaired, that refers to a malfunctioning part of the body, non-working eyes. In my opinion, vision comes from the mind. And so very few people in the world, in my opinion, are vision impaired. There are many sight impaired people, and that degree of impairment can vary from having a small sight impairment to being totally blind. So I have more of an issue with the term vision impaired or visually impaired than I do with the word blind. Uh, Blind is what we are. But it's also used in in ways that maybe it shouldn't be. But you have to remember, to go back to a point that you made at the beginning of the discussion, sighted people, many of them at least, cannot comprehend what life would be like without sight. And so I honestly think that when someone says you'd have to be blind not to realize this, it's because it, it stems from tremendous lack of comprehension as to what it would be like to be blind or sight impaired, and even a fear of being blind or sight impaired. And I think we have to sort of allow that. I think in a way, this was actually illustrating the point that I'm making by raising this issue. So the term vision traditionally has meant the ability to see. Vision is a quality in your eyeball. And if you're blind, you don't have vision. We quite regularly refer to people who are low vision. When I have worked for various companies who want to acknowledge that not all people who have some sight loss identify as blind, we've bandied it about. Well, what do we say instead? And the consensus appears to have uh, formed around the term low vision. So when you want to make a distinction, you talk about blind and low vision people. So again, what's happened here is that we have all the corporate types, and I must admit, you know, I've just gone through my own organization, a strategic planning exercise, and we have a vision statement. And it's really common for an organization to have a vision statement. I would argue that thinking about this, that's not necessarily particularly appropriate because we have allowed vision over time to be used as a substitute for knowledge. See, this is what it all comes back to. When you look at the way that that terms like blind and vision are being used, the lack of vision really is being used in that context to mean a lack of knowledge. You don't know where you're going, right? If you don't have a vision statement in an organization, or if you're a politician and you don't have a vision for your country's future, you're kind of portrayed as not knowing what you're doing, you're stumbling and bumbling into the future. And that stuff has got to reflect back on the way that blind people, real blind people, or for that matter, those with low vision, are actually perceived. And you're absolutely right, Nick. Because we are a low incidence population, we do have to make allowances. But I think that it's time that we started really thinking about the public education that is required. You know, we've got terrible unemployment in our community. And even though all of this technology has advanced, you know, I sit here, I've got a braille display and screen readers, and obviously those of us who are blind 
or low vision who are listening to this are using some sort of assistive technology to make that happen. So we've made enormous strides, and yet it appears that the unemployment statistics have not really had a dent made in them at all. Why is that? It's because predominantly other people's attitudes. I mean, certainly there is an issue of access to training and opportunity, but a lot of it is due to attitudinal barriers. And I don't think we're going to crack those attitudinal barriers until we start insisting on some more appropriate language. I'll give you another example of this. And I come back to race often when I look at minorities and the progress that is being made and the progress that is still to be made. Because I met a politician when I was involved in the government relations area back in the 1990s. And this politician was uh, a a Māori, a a member of New Zealand's indigenous population. And she said to me that she felt that Māori and blind people, any disabled person, had a lot in common because of the discrimination and the misperceptions that we experienced. Now, when I was a kid, and I'm appalled to tell you this, but anybody who's listening from New Zealand will, I'm sure, back me up. There was a terrible expression that some people used in New Zealand in the 1970s when I was growing up, and that expression was a Maori day off. It's a hideous expression, and what it basically means was that the people were taking a day off for no, no really legitimate reason. And it was in very common use. <laughs> and when I look back on it now, it's just absolutely disgusting that it was in common use. So we do move on, you know, and we move on when we assert our rights to our terminology. And I think it's not just being hypersensitive. It's not just you know, being politically correct or doing it for its own sake. It's because we see the connection between common, regular inculcation of negativity when the word blind is used in these ways and the outcomes for us. What I'm saying to you is, The outcomes for us are directly being impacted negatively by the constant negative reference to the word blind. Jonathan Mosin, Mosin at Large Podcast. News you can use now if you're a QBraille XL user or considering one. And uh, this has come in from several people, but Amy Howard said it first. So we'll read her email and she says, hi, Jonathan, I wanted to let you know. I have devised a solution for the ill-positioned spacebar. I usually have one hand I use to hit, yeah, hit that thing, hit, hit the spacebar. Whenever anybody's, this is me talking now, this is me talking. Whenever anybody says hit the spacebar, I'm reminded of the very first commercial audio tutorial I produced, which was for SoundForge, and Freedom Scientific picked up the rights to that, actually, when I produced it in 2000. But then when somebody from Freedom Scientific was reviewing it, she said, I'm going to get you to go back and change all the references to hitting the spacebar or hitting enter because we don't want to promote keyboard abuse. Anyway, I'm going to continue with Amy's message now. What I have found, she says, is to move my arm forward a smidge so I can hit, hit the space bar with my thumb without having to scrunch my thumb under my hand to hit the space bar. I have been able to do this without sacrificing much speed. Had I not found that little trick, I wouldn't be getting one. Also, on the cube rail, you can hold Control-Alt-Tab, and you can then arrow through the open windows like holding down Alt and pressing Tab until you get to your choice of open programs. So don't let that keep you from considering a cube rail. With all that being said, she continues, I'm also going to get the Mantis as I am a computer science student. I don't think I can write code in UEB, and I also don't think I could type as fast on the Braille with a lowercase b keyboard. Now that I'm going to get these two different displays, I'll be selling my Brilliant BI40 Vario Ultra. I don't really want to, but why have three displays? Refresher Braille 18, and lastly, my Focus 40 Blue 5th Gen. Holy jumping jellyfish, Amy. You got the works in there, mate. If 
you know anybody who might want to buy a brow display, send them my way. Shop ABS today. Amy's Brow Supplies. Goodness gracious me. What a fascinating email. Thank you, Amy. And you keep hitting that space by hit it. Hit it, I tell you. While we're on the subject of brow, Aaron Linson says, Hello, Jonathan. I'm glad to see that New Zealand has beaten the coronavirus. I hope that the US will follow soon. Well, I hope so, too. I do note this week a comment from the Secretary of Health in the US that the US is running out of time to get the virus under control. And, of course, now the US is responsible for a quarter of the deaths. Uh, So I've got everything crossed for you guys as well. On last week's show, says Aaron, one of the listeners was having an issue with their QBrail XL only switching to the two most recent applications. There is an update to the firmware of the QBrail that fixes this issue. I tend to go into the Windows taskbar by hitting, see, there's another keyboard abuser, hitting Windows key and the tab key. I hope this helps, and I've switched away from using any keyboard except my Q Braille. And for JAWS users, you can, of course, press insert F10 to get the app list as well. So I don't know whether the Q Braille has an insert key, but I imagine it would for screen reader compatibility. Aaron continues, my work is all done online and I've been traditional keyboard free for three weeks now. I've noticed the Mantis Braille with a capital B display from APH. And what bothers me is APH's issue of butchering products without any notice to customers. I'll follow with interest as Greg Stilson is over APH's product division. I don't mind the QBrail's spacebar being in the middle of the keyboard. My hands naturally rest in that position when brailing anyway. The reason is I'm so used to the position from using a braille writer. I have a humanware Brailliant BI-14 which has the spacebar in the middle of the display. I find that annoying as I have to lift my hands a bit so I don't accidentally put a space whether I'm typing or reading. And another very happy Mantis user. This is Katie Reekin and she says, Hi Jonathan, I'm another early adopter of the Mantis Q40. I'm a court reporter in Minneapolis. I do remember, Katie, because I had a chat with you on FSCast, I recall. So every day I'm using an uppercase braille display to edit and produce trial transcripts. The reason the Mantis interested me was that with a traditional Perkins keyboard, the commands used for the control, shift and function keys are multi-layered and involve pressing many keys at once. I use these commands often, and my transcription software has a great deal of built-in keyboard functionality. I find that the Mantis is much easier on my hands, as I only have to press at most three keys at once for these commands, instead of several repetitions of multiple key presses for a single function. The Mantis does have its quirks, as does any new product, but I'll gladly take them in exchange for my hands not feeling like they're going to fall off at the end of the day. And she says, love the podcast. Thank you, Katie. I think this is something that's exciting a lot of people, the benefits of having a QWERTY keyboard and a Braille display all in one unit, because I often carry around my iPhone keyboard and the Braille display. So to have it all in one device is pretty compelling. And I do agree with you about the multi-layered commands. I find them cumbersome, even if you commit them to memory. And when you use something often enough, you can commit it to memory, of course. But when you are cording using a Braille display, and for those who aren't familiar with the way Braille displays work, the term cord applies when you press the space bar in conjunction with another set of keys to get a particular function. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the space bar. You could use, say, the backspace key in combination with other commands. So when you're doing this chord thing, if you're brailing really fast, you have to be quite careful because sometimes you press the space bar and then you brail your next letter and you didn't intend to do a chord command, but you're going so quickly that you end up somewhere you never expected to be. So I like the idea of this QWERTY keyboard input with a braille display a lot. And a follow-up email from Dave, who sent in a message a couple of weeks ago indicating some problems he was having with his QBraille XL. He says, I'm brailing this email on my QBraille XL using my Windows 10 PC and JAWS. I've got a much newer PC now, and the lag issues I mentioned a couple of weeks ago have disappeared. 
The display is connected via USB to my PC. I did manage to get one of my Cube Rails to connect to my Nokia 4B Android phone and my iPhone 7 Plus. When connected with that particular unit, I was able to get Braille output and enter Bluetooth keyboard commands. The problem was that when my screen locked and then unlocked, I lost Braille output and had to reconnect. The other two Q Brailles would give me only Braille keyboard input and Braille output, but no Bluetooth keyboard input, so I couldn't get hybrid mode to work. Seems like there is some kind of bug-related issue going on. I've tried phoning and emailing HIMS tech support, but I haven't gotten anywhere with that. He also says that while Bonnie may not like it, the only time he has ever been discouraged from using echolocation was by a trainer at the CGI. Oh dear. I wonder whether that was just that individual trainer or whether they want you to try and trust your dog. That could be it, I suppose, if you're training with a new dog and you're getting feedback from echolocation. Maybe that's the thing. I'm not trying to excuse it or justify it. Just wondering what might have been going on there. Thank you, David. Podcast. Hello, Jonathan and everyone else. I wanted to follow up with a listener comment that somebody posted on the last podcast that Siri shortcuts were not working with Castro and that it was saying that the shortcuts would not work due to the shortcut security settings. And I want to demonstrate how to fix that. What you need to do is go to the settings screen. You're looking for an icon in your settings screen called shortcuts, which is where I should be right now. Let me um, just verify that. Yep, so I just flicked right and left once and then uh, it's told me that I was on shortcuts. So I'm going to double tap that. iCloud Sync on. Okay, so the first item we see is iCloud Sync. We don't need to worry about that, so let's keep flicking to the right. Sync shortcuts order on. Share and security, heading. Now this is a heading called Share and Security, which is what we want. So if we flick right one more time. Allow untrusted shortcuts on. We see allow untrusted shortcuts. This, as you can hear, is on, and it's what you want. Uh, you want to go in and turn this on, otherwise your settings or your shortcuts for third-party apps won't won't work um, for untrusted apps. So you want to turn this on, and then your Castro settings should or your Castro sh- shortcuts should work. Thank you, Brian. And for those who upgraded to Beta 1, Developer Beta 1, because it's not out in public beta form yet, of iOS 14, and were disconsolate, disconsolate as I was, to find out that Castro had some issues, they just released a build in the App Store a few days ago that fixes those issues. So if you had to revert to an inferior podcast player because you wanted to stay on iOS 14, I actually love Castro so much that I downgraded back to 13 again so I could have my Castro back. But now I'm back on 14 because Castro is sorted. Then get that build from the App Store and happy iOS 14ing. Hello, Jonathan. Uh, Gary Donahue here. Just wanted to concur with you on the use, the metaphorical use of the word blind. It's very difficult to to make these points in, in general conversation because people often talk about political correctness gone mad, but I think it definitely the metaphorical use does reinforce the uh, the negative in terms of the literal. Uh, and the way I describe it when I talk to people about this is. Do you honestly think there's a brick wall between the literal use of a word and the figurative use of the word? Of course, the the figurative use infects the literal use in terms of meaning. And why would it be otherwise? Last week, people were talking about their favourite Bluetooth keyboards. And also there was a conversation around games that people were reminiscing about. And I'm going to bring those two together. I've got the Logitech K380 here, which is a really nice keyboard, which can connect up to three devices. I've got the Mac, I've got the iPad, and I've got my phone. 
and it's got a nice physical switch on the left hand side for turning it on and off and then F1, 2 and 3 connect to different devices. So I've got it connected to the phone. So I'm not going to touch my phone again now if I do VO right arrow. Be my eyes. Wake up. Twitter. There you go. It's quite fast. So let me do VO command. That's all three keys. And then right arrow. Characters. Words. Headings. Going through the rotor. Hints. Speaking rate. Speaking rate. Now if I keep those three keys down and press the down arrow. 75%. 70%. 65%. 60%. 55%. Let's leave it at that. So you can control things via the rotor by holding those three modifier keys down and using the arrow keys. So what I'm going to show you now is my favorite game of the moment on iOS. It's called Frots. I absolutely love this game. It's a text adventure game. I don't know how to use Siri from the keyboard. And as I say, I'm not going to touch my phone again. So let's do command space. This brings up an app button. This is spotlight. And if I type in Frots, F R O 83, 49, 14, 18 items found. Top search result, Frots. Enter. Browse IFDB button. And now we're in Frots. Browse IFDB button. Browse IFDB. That stands for Interactive Fiction Database. There are thousands of games you can play, guys. There are thousands. If I do VO right arrow. Frauds. Settings button. Settings button. Have a browse in there if you want. Resume button. Resume my game. Let's keep going. Select a story. Search. Search field. Select a story and you can search for it if you've got dozens of stories that you've downloaded. But if I keep on going. Recently played. Recently heading. played. Anchorhead button. Anchorhead. This is the one that we're going to play. It comes with a couple of dozen already downloaded, including Zork. Zork is in there. So let's hit VO spacebar on Anchorhead. N C H O R A T D. Press R to restore any other key to begin. Press R to restore or any other key to begin. Let's hit enter. Outside the real estate office, a grim little cul-de-sac, tucked away in a corner of the claustrophobic tangle of narrow, twisting avenues that largely constitute the older portion of Anchorhead. Like most of the streets in this city, it is ancient, shadowy, and leads essentially nowhere. The lane ends here at the real estate agent's office, which lies to the east, and winds its way back toward the center of town to the west. A narrow, garbage-choked alley opens to the southeast. Command greater than. Let's try going to the estate agents with E for east. E. Opening the real estate office door first, it seems to be locked. Mm. In the distance, you can hear the lonesome keening of a train whistle drifting on the wind. <laughs> Command greater than. Let's do I for inventory. I. You are wearing your wedding ring, your mm. trench coat and your clothes. In addition, you have in your hand your umbrella. The pockets of your trench coat are empty. So Command we don't have the key. So let's go SE to go into that alleyway. So, alley, this narrow aperture between two buildings is nearly blocked with piles of rotting cardboard boxes and overstuffed garbage cans. Ugly, have crumbling brick walls to either side totter oppressively over you. The alley ends here at a tall, wooden fence. High up on the wall of the northern building there is a narrow, transom-style window. Command greater than. Okay, so we could try and go to the window. Let's do U for up. U, the window is too high. We need Command to put greater something than. under the window. Let's examine the trash cans. Examine cans. Examine cans. The metal garbage cans are stuffed to overflowing with slowly decomposing refuse. refuse. Command greater than. Um, push can under window. Push can under window. Grunting and holding your breath, you manhandle one of the filthy cans under the window. Command greater than. Get on can. Get on can. You clamber onto the wobbling garbage can, precariously balanced. You can just reach the lower edge of the window from here. I don't actually A sudden know gust why. of wind blows a cold spray of rain into your face. We're going up Command towards greater this than. window, but let's go uh, up. You. You. Opening the transom window first. Closing the umbrella first, it's a tight squeeze, but you just manage to wriggle through, dropping quietly to the floor inside. File room. Peering through the murk, you can make out the blocky outlines of filing cabinets lining the walls and the doorway to the west. 
A window high up on the south wall lets in a very faint illumination. That's command where we've just come than. in. And it's ready for another command. I'm going to leave it there, guys. Don't you love this sort of thing? So I haven't done anything other than just typing in commands. It's that friendly. It's really, really good to play. There are so many different games, whatever your genre. If you like this kind of thing, give it a go. So I haven't touched the screen at all. I've been doing it all from the keyboard. If I do VOH to go home. Messages. We're out of frots and back onto the home screen. Enjoy frots. F-R-O-T-Z. It's free. Give it a go. Well, the price is right. I thank you very much for that, Robin. That certainly takes me back. And those Infocom text adventure games from the 80s were very complex, weren't they? I mean, they could do all sorts of things. And it's nice to know that that sort of game is alive and well. I do remember when I was the product manager for the Braille Nose, we put a Frotz interpreter in there, which was a bit of a controversial decision. But my thinking at the time was it is a fun thing to do and it is a way to get kids used to working in Braille and using the product and all that good stuff. So good to know it's all happening. I'll have to download that and have a play. That does sound like a lot of fun. Regarding your recommendation of the Logitech keyboard that you have, I have one of those too. Logitech keyboard model numbers are almost as confusing as the Nokia phones used to be. (laughs) Uh, But I do have one with the three function keys and it's very handy in our living room because we have, for example, the Apple TV, which can take keyboard input and the Samsung Smart TV, which can as well. So it's useful to be able to have one keyboard to rule them all and just switch between whatever device you want to control. So that's genius. The one thing I would say about them is that our Apple TV and the Samsung TV both support control of the respective devices via the function keys. I don't know whether you can get those functions. It's possible holding down another key. Perhaps the FN key gives you the standard function key functions. But very good keyboards, quite nice to type on. And you can get a range of them. Some of them are solar-powered, Some work with, I think, rechargeable batteries that are built in. Others, you can have AA or AAA batteries in them. The 380 keyboard that Robin, you and I both have, it has these sort of rounded keys. I'm not a big fan of the rounded keys, but it's all right. You know, it's it's, it's not a showstopper. I definitely prefer the Apple Magic keyboard for long-term typing with my iPhone. Hi, Jonathan. Adi from India. And my favorite topic, just here to share my views on this wonderful accessory called Bluetooth keyboards. Okay, I got my first Bluetooth keyboard in the month of March, just a week before the lockdown. And it is like a magic potion in my life, the Apple Magic Keyboard. So if you have to get lockdown, please get lockdown with your keyboard. This is what I say. My mother has seen me more with the keyboard than with anything else in this last, uh, in during the lockdown period. This is an amazing little keyboard which gives you an excellent typing experience. Very lightweight, very portable, dedicated, dedicated function keys for media playback, pause, rewind, forward, and you can uh, pair, you know, connect it via the lightning port on your iDevice in addition to the Bluetooth pairing. Wonderful battery life where. Uh, I have charged it in March and the next I charged it was in June 2020 and uh, you know the iPhones are a very good consumption device but if somebody is ready to invest a bit in learning this keyboards can be a great accessory and act as a bridge to you know uh, shift from a consumption device to a content creation device. However, this was my second choice. My first choice of keyboard to anyone who can get it is the Logitech K811. Anybody who uses it says you need to use it to experience it. People say it provides a superior typing experience as compared to any other keyboard and the Apple Magic keyboard is inspired or was inspired by the Logitech A811. This is what people say. I don't have any first hand experience but I don't know why Logitech does not make it available anymore. I was not very kind to my Apple Magic keyboard. I threw some dark spells on it. I spilled some water on it and trust me I am not as light as my Apple Magic keyboard. So I sat on it twice and it has kindly taken my weight. So I was very worried and I started my hunt for a backup portable keyboard. So during one of your shows and podcasts on Mozart at Large, you mentioned about the iClever, which is a very good keyboard. I have done my research and this is a foldable keyboard with several variations it comes. So one very good popular model is the one which costs, I think, £95 and it folds like a wallet. So it's a triple fold wherein 
once you open it it becomes like a full size laptop keyboard and you can carry it even in your pocket and for a bluetooth keyboard which folds it provides a very good typing experience it pairs with usb it connects parallelly with your windows device your android device your iphone your iphone which is very rare and a good battery life the next keyboard i want to talk about uh, is the logitech keys to go A lot of people within the blind community also use this keyboard it has two models one dedicated to the ios and one for the android and windows the ios model provides a good typing experience it has a lot of shortcut keys and dedicated keys for iphone users the challenge is it does not connect via usb and at one time you can pair it only to one device suppose you want to pair it with your iphone uh, ipad in addition to your iphone you cannot do it unless you unpair it with your iphone this is what i know and uh, one basic keyboard for somebody who is very new to typing and just wants to get his you know feet touching the water the logitech k380 is a very good choice a uh, low cost keyboard which pairs to multiple operating systems and my last recommendation is the keyboard called rivo 2 this is a very up good upgrade to rivo 1 it has a inbuilt speaker and a dedicated uh, 3.5 mm headphone jack this is a product is for the blind hence it is expensive and the company is a korean based company it has 20 buttons and guess what it weighs i think 55 to 60 grams there is no competition in terms of portability uh, there is a learning curve which can be quite steep it uses a t9 method of typing if i recollect and i think there is another method also the best part is you can pair it to uh, your android uh, talkback your samsung voice over or voice assistant your apple uh, screen reader voice over and even to multiple apple devices so you can pair it to your iphone ipad and apple watch and just with few uh, clicks on the keyboard it can shift you know uh, where you want to type so this is excellent of course it comes with its risk and it cannot substitute a full time keyboard in case only typing is your requirement but a, a very good option for somebody who wants to really dig deep and you know uh, have a very good lightweight accessory so people who use it either i am in love with it or hate it there you go there's a few keyboards to be getting on with i have not played with the rivo or revo i don't know how you pronounce it so Uh, my screen reader says Revo, uh, but uh, maybe it is Rivo. In any case, I've not played with it. It strikes me as an interesting concept because one of the things I really missed when I migrated from a Nokia phone to iPhone was T9. I was a T9 ninja, and I could input texts and documents, quite long documents at times, long emails with T9 with remarkable fluidity. And of course, we were going. to the touch screen when in those days the only input method available was the original default typing where you either had to double tap or split tap everything when i first got an iphone there were no bluetooth keyboards no braille displays yeah so i did miss t9 a lot it would be interesting to go back and try t9 again in an iphone context so if you have one of these keyboards or any other for that matter let us know what you think hey jonathan it's mike fair favorite keyboard is the Keychron K6. I have it in front of me here. I'll give you a little sound test. Those are red switches, optical switches. So it it they're uh light beam operated. You can press down and it breaks a beam of light and that's what registers the switch. Uh it does use uh Bluetooth uh version 3. uh but there's there's really no noticeable lag uh it it's quite quick and it's it's pretty reliable it does have a sleep mode that you can disable uh which i have cuz the last thing i want is to have to wake up the keyboard when i need it it has a 4000 ma battery uh which is is nice that uh, with the lights off you can turn off the lighting and then it'll last you a really long time the only fly in the ointment is you can't tell the level of the battery it doesn't report that to uh uh the apple ios widget unfortunately so uh, as blind people you have no way of checking you just have to keep it nicely charged uh you can use it well while, while it is charging there's no problem there it has a number of advantages very tactile for blind people it's got two switches uh, on the side slide switches one of them is a two position slider and on top and you can set that to either windows and android or apple and ios and uh it's just a simple flick of the switch to change between those modes right beneath that is another switch it's a three position switch top position is bluetooth 
uh, which I have it in now because I'm using it. Next switch down is off. So if you're traveling, you want to save power, you can turn it off. Bottom position is cable. So if you're going to use it plugged into a computer, you switch to that and it just automatically goes to that uh, connection. So it, you can have up to three devices connected, plus, of course, the one you're physically connected to and switch between them with the FN plus one, two, and three. Uh, I believe it is uh, keys. Really nice, nice keyboard, and uh, very, very much uh, glad I've invested in it. I've, I've also invested in its sequel, the K8, uh, which is coming out. Uh, it was successful on Kickstarter. I should get mine sometime September-ish. And that's a, a bit of a bigger board. It's, it's, uh, this is a 60% keyboard, so it's a bit cramped. You do have to hold down the FN key to use the function keys if you need them as uh, function keys rather than numbers. I think the 10 keyless size uh, is, is going to be a, a bit, more, uh, bit more roomy, a bit more comfortable. And also the new one's going to use Bluetooth K, uh, 5, so that should help uh, as well. This uses Bluetooth 3. No real connection issues, but I'm hoping that with the Bluetooth 5, it will report the battery status. And uh, certainly it will be more future-proof going forward. Thank you, Mike. Brian Gaff in the UK is chiming in on the Bluetooth keyboard question with a couple of points. He says he uses a log keyboard, and I'm not sure if he's abbreviating Logitech or whether there is a brand of keyboard called Log that I'm not familiar with. But he's asking about what he perceives to be the inconsistency of the way the arrow keys are working. And I suspect what's happening is you've got to appreciate that when you're using an iPhone with a Bluetooth keyboard, you have two modes. You can have quick nav mode on or quick nav mode off. When you have quick nav mode on, the left and right arrow keys will navigate you between items as if you were flicking left and right with your single finger. And up and down arrow will move by whatever is selected in the rotor. So if your rotor is set to words and you have quick nav on by pressing left and right arrow together and then you up and down arrow, you're going to move a word at a time because that's what's selected in the rotor. To change what is selected in the rotor, you can press the left arrow and up arrow together or the right arrow and uh, up arrow together. Actually, the down arrow key works just as well. Brian also raises a question, why is the at key on the number row? And of course, if you are anywhere else in the world, in the English speaking world anyway, that uses a Bluetooth keyboard, you might well ask, why is the at key not on the number row (laughs) if it isn't? The at key is on the number row in the US keyboard layout which I think most countries in the English-speaking world use other than the UK, which has its own keyboard layout. And uh, I think the the quote key and the at key are swapped around or something like that. I've never gotten particularly familiar with the UK keyboard layout. And whenever I notice that I've got it, I quickly try and change it back to the keyboard that I'm familiar with. So that's why it sounds like you need to try and find a way to make your keyboard use the UK layout. And it could be that your language, Brian, is set to English US in your iPhone and not English UK. Yes, it is now time for some people's favorite part of the show. Bonnie Moosin, welcome to the Bonnie Bulletin. Hi, guys. I'm glad that you're doing the Bonnie Bulletin because it'd be weird if somebody else was. Yeah, hi, guys. How is everybody? Oh, everybody's good. Great. I uh, I'm Great. Happy on... birthday to America. We're celebrating the 4th of July, Independence Day today. Um, of course, the highlight of my Independence Day, which is not taking place on Coney Island, today is the hot dog eating contest. See, and I that have, is just gross. I'm sorry, but I, you have my jockey to thank for getting me involved in this because I'm not even. What are a, they proving with this? I hot do dog not eating know. Thing? It's my sister won't even allow me to talk about it, but apparently it's a quite big, right big sport, competitive eating. But they usually have it on Coney Island and the mayor's there and all this stuff, but because of the um, coronavirus, it's taking place at a secret location, which I don't even know what that means. How can they make sure they didn't cheat? Well, they're they're just not divulging it to the public, I guess. But are they So do do spectators actually normally go and watch Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a big deal. So Joey Chestnut, I think, is defending his title. I started watching it a long time ago, and it's just kind of become this weird tradition of watching the Coney Island. Yeah. Hot dog eating contest. What do you think of the the use of the term blind when it's used to – you could do a search and replace in your word processor mm-hmm. and you could change the word blind. You could just 
when it says find what, you type blind mm -hmm. and then replace with and you type stupid. And then you press control A, uh, alt A to make all the replacements and it would still make sense, right? So that's what I'm getting at. But even the word stupid, some people find pejorative because right. it, it sort of referred to people with less mental faculties. I don't hear it as it's interesting because I don't know whether it's just the evolution of words, but I don't, I haven't, I was trying to think, I haven't really heard those words used in that context. Sometimes you do see it in print, but I haven't heard like, oh, that's the blind leading the blind, unless I actually am leading a blind person and someone will make some weird comment. But it doesn't really bother me on some levels because I, I just haven't heard it, you know, and I don't know whether it's because political correctness over the past 20, 30 years. I heard it more maybe when I was a kid than I do as an adult, but I just, I don't hear it. I mean, other people may, it may be a part of their daily. How do you define political correctness? I think. I have to say, that's a term that really pushes my buttons because it's generally used to belittle somebody who has a different opinion. Yeah, it's, I think that to me, and, and it's it can cause so many arguments because I remember being in a university level class and the professor was saying that it's not disabled people or blind people. It's people who are blind. And I right. lost it. I said, look, I said, I'm blind. Yeah, You I, can't I, yeah. sugarcoat it. And that's what I want to call myself. And, and you have no right to tell me what I want to call myself. I, I am so proud of the way New Zealand's handled this. Yeah. Because when we started on our disability strategy about 20 years ago now, they put out a consultation document which talked about people experiencing disability. <laughs> and um, disabled people came back and said, no. Oh. And they said, we are disabled people. We are blind people. Yeah, I mean, and people don't experience Maori. No, <laughs> and, it's, and it's great. And then whenever I sort of tune into or get to go to conferences in other countries, you hear all this – sort of topsy-turvy, you know, be really careful walking on eggshells yeah. language, like people who are blind and people with disabilities. And it's so cumbersome and it draws more attention to it the does. impairment. I mean, to me, political correctness is not calling someone by a really rude word that would be, you know, super offensive. Like but political correctness slur. is usually a pejorative term. It, to me, it is. and it, it's, it usually is. It was interesting because I read an article the other day on – the words that should be taken out of public relations languages. And honestly, all the words I saw in there, I haven't seen. I don't know what, what, where they were doing these, but some of them were things that you wouldn't even think of, like no can do. Mm -hmm. And that apparently comes from, there were a lot of um, Chinese migrants who came over to work the railroads right. back in the day. And a lot of them had obviously limited English because they just moved here and, and they would say no can do or long time no see. And, and they it sort of came as they were thought people were making fun of them. Now and, you've got Hall and Oates, I can't go for that. And stuck I in can't my go head. for that. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, so it, I think, and, and another one was tone deaf because that was right. offensive to deaf people. Yeah. But I started to think about that and I should ask, um, people that I know who are deaf, is that really, is, is tone deafness, because you, to me, or people who are tone deaf, they can't do music. It has nothing necessarily to do with their hearing. So is it really offensive? Or? But, you know, the, the reason why I raise this, because I'm always sort of on the lookout for topics that might be good mm -hmm. discussion points, and I raised it because this came up on the blind sub forum on Reddit uh -huh. just in the last week. And a sighted guy, I think it was a guy, popped up and said, I just read this thing on Twitter that said, you know, don't use the word blind when you mean ignorant or stupid. Is that true? Do blind people got to get offended by this? And a lot of blind people wrote back and said, no, these people are politically correct. You know, insert expletive here um, and said, don't worry about it. So a few of us chimed in and got downvoted for doing so to say, actually, yes, I am offended if you use the word blind to mean ignorant or stupid. And here's why. And I've talked on the show about just the constant negative imagery that that conveys. So what I'm getting to in response to what you've just said is that you could probably ask a dozen deaf oh, people yeah. mm -hmm. and get a dozen slightly nuanced answers. responses. And I, yeah. yeah, and going talking about the whole name changing of agencies, 
Um, yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. I, <laughs> I used, that used to bother me a bit, but then when I had it really explained to me, it made a lot of sense. It could be very cumbersome to say, oh, the whatever of the blind and visually impaired or the blind and low vision. But very few people are actually completely blind. And if you talk to someone who is losing their sight, they don't want to be identified as blind because they're not. So I think you do have to have that inclusion because you, if you call someone and say, I'm calling from the Mosin Center for the Blind, and we want to talk to you about some – well, I'm not blind. I just have trouble seeing. So right. you do have to have that kind of – But why alienate blind people in the process? So I think this is what uh... – who brought this up originally? Brian Gaff, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's come up before. This is what people are saying. If, for example, I lived in Australia, I would feel totally alienated by an organization called Vision Australia. Yeah, that's, it doesn't that's speak confusing. To me. That's so I, very confusing. I think that um, actually in New Zealand, again, we have got it right after yeah. a lot of consultation. It's, it's a bit of a mouthful, but the it organization is. is now called Blind and Low Vision NZ. And I and think fair enough, you know, if, if, if some people <laughs> need to just be taken along that that journey blind and low vision nz is inclusive oh yeah if you take blind out it's not inclusive no it's if not. they just it's... called it vision new zealand i would be out on the streets over that yeah that's well there's a there's an agency here in new zealand and for a long time it's called vision west i assumed it had something to do with vision loss it doesn't it's a I think they do like a lot of support workers and support care and that sort of thing. But I would see job ads for Vision West. And I thought, is this some sort of agency that helps blind people or visually? And it was very confusing. And then I finally found out what it actually did. But it it confused the it confused me for a long time. So you wanted to talk about frauds. Yeah, well, when I I got in sort of into the conversation that Robin was having, and at first I thought he had some sort of GPS, <laughs> and he was looking around his neighborhood, and I was getting a bit nervous. It's like so it's like a pretty trippy neighborhood. It does, and I'm thinking to myself, because this sounds like New York or something, but um. It was. I'm like, man, that is a really detailed GPS. So I'm at the alley, cr- you know, crammed with garbage cans. I'm like, I would love that kind of GPS <laughs> telling me everything. It even knew about the garbage cans in the alley. I mean, what happens when they pick them up? Is the alley cleared of the garbage cans? But, yeah, that was kind of cool. Jonathan Mosin, Mosin at Large Podcast. Hi, this is Sari Hillis, and I wanted to tell you about a new microphone that I have purchased. And for those of you that have listened to any of my shows, you will know that I did this. Um, this is a 99 Canadian dollar microphone. It's a USB microphone. Uh, you just plug it in and it works. It's called the Samson Meteor USB Studio Condenser Microphone. Samson, S-A-M-S-O-N. And it is a condenser microphone, so not dynamic. So you do have to understand what that means. You're going to get a bit more background noise. You're going to have to, ooh, not do that. You're going to have to speak off access a little bit to avoid some of the transients that you might get or use a pop filter, which you can do. And, but it's got a lot of neat features. It's a small microphone. Uh, on its legs, it's probably about four inches tall, two inches tall. Without, when the legs are folded up, it sits in a carrying case when it's not when it not in use. It's 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 a, it's a really just a neat design. It feels so cool. It's all die cast. The body is die cast metal, and it's very well shielded. Um, it has a proprietary capsule in it that Samson makes. Apparently, twenty five millimeters is the diaphragm. Uh, I guess diameter, which is very large. And as you can hear, it gives a pretty rich tone, I would have to say. Right. That was in my hand. Now I'm sitting it on the desk beside the computer, the table beside the computer. And I'm clicking a key. And as you hear, there's very little transfer. You can hear the click, but not all the boom, which you often get with microphones. Now, to compare this, I will show you the microphone that I used before, which is the Blue Yeti. So here we are now, the Yeti is being used. It's in its cardioid pattern. The Yeti has four different patterns in it. It's a very big microphone. It 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 looks really, you know, 
I mean, wow, you, you could... It's formidable. Uh, it stands about, I don't know, six to eight inches tall sitting on its mount. But as you can hear, the Yeti's right next to the computer and you've got a lot more low frequency happening. That's just me clicking a computer key. It sounds like an elephant walking around, but it's got a very sensitive mic. The gain that I ha the gain is down all the way at this point. I forget what the actual level in Windows is, but the gain is down. The Yeti 2 has monitoring. The Samson has a monitor. It has a head headphone jack. You plug the headphone in, and so does the Yeti. So you can just monitor yourself in real time. No latency, no Windows jiggery-pokery, right? <laughs> or Mac, for that matter. The Yeti has a mount, as I say. The mount is... You could you could use it as a weapon. It's its quite heavy. <laughs> and and it's designed to look cool, right? It's It's... Just oh, it's metal. It's cool. it's just cool. Uh, it's finicky because it has set screws you have to attach to the microphone with a little washer that has to go between the microphone hole and the stand, and you have to do and you you lose bits. You, you can lose bits if you're not careful with this mount. I often don't use the mount. I set it on a, a microphone stand. But yes, the Yeti has a volume, uh, a mute switch. It turns it off. Um, a gain control on the back of it, and a pattern selector on the back of it. So the pattern selector is the bottom one, and the gain is the top one. They look exactly the same. The volume one and the mute one are pretty self-identifiable. So here's the cardioid pattern. Now we'll check some other patterns out. Here's the stereo pattern. The Yeti is famous because it's a stereo microphone. A lot of people want that. They think it's really cool, you know? Just, you can have people over here and people over here, and it's kind of, it's a neat thing, right? There's the stereo pattern. Here's omnidirectional Yeti. So a lot more room noise, and you can have a bunch of musicians playing, and it would sound really kind of neat if you wanted it to be a mono thing, but, but omnidirectional, right? Yes, indeed. We're back to cardioid, which is what Samson only does. That's the only Samson's job. This is basically in front of the microphone. Um, the microphone is meant to be talked into the side of. It kind of doesn't look that way. And I think that's misleading. The Samson, actually, it's very clear you talk into the side of it. But the Yeti just has this big screen on the top, like most most microphones have. And you would think that you would talk into the top of it here, just, just by how it looks, but you don't. All right. <laughs> that's just an interesting point that a YouTube... Uh, person brought up. I hadn't thought of it before, because I just tested it till it worked, so I knew what to do. But anyway, here is uh, the last setting, which is it's, it's a, a bipolar kind of thing, where you can have two people, uh, say, across a table, and you can use uh, this microphone to have an interview. So that's kind of neat. So the Eddie has four patterns, and we're back to cardioid again here. The Eddie has four patterns. It is $140 Canadian. So it's $50 more than the Samson, which is actually pretty good considering it has four patterns and uh, um, three diaphragms and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, it's bigger than the Samson. It's huge, actually. It weighs 1.6 kilograms, which is uh, just over three pounds, right? That's, that's a lot. Um, might be almost four pounds. Anyway... It's a lot of weight to carry around in a go bag. It's quite a good microphone, but it is a lot of weight. Samson is a lot more portable. And uh, we'll just go back to the Samson now, I think. Why don't we? All right, just... I'll be back with you in a second. All right, here we are back with the Samson microphone. Now, this is the Samson Meteor USB Studio Condenser Microphone. So, yes, my summation about this is that the Samson has a volume switch, it has a mute button, it has a monitor jack for a headphone, or you could plug speakers in, I suppose, if you wanted. Um, and it has a USB cable, of course. Uh, it doesn't have a gain control, which the Eddie does have, but that's all right, that's all right, you can, you can deal with that. The Samson has its own foldable legs, you don't have to detach them. Or attach them, they're just there. You just unfold them and whoosh, it has a little tripod it can stand on. It can be set on a, a microphone stand. It has a, a screw mount 
ride in it. The Yeti has one too. The Yeti has four patterns, which is great. The Samson has one, and it uses it quite well. I think it has a lovely, lovely tone, and I just really like it. So there you go. That's the Samson Meteor USB Studio Condenser Mic. It's 99 Canadian dollars. It's available at Amazon, and I hope you like it. For Amazon at large... I'm Sarah Hillis. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for your answer on the previous podcast, and I'll just update you on my Yamaha system. My Yamaha RN602 arrived, and I installed it. It works really well, and what I like about it, besides the great sound quality, is the physical buttons. It has very tactile, very good physical dials for bass, treble, and balance Also, the other buttons are quite tactile. If you know what you're doing, you'll manage to operate this amplifier. And for the most part, you can control it completely from the MusicCast app. So it's a very accessible experience, although I do think that there's work to be done for Yamaha on the app. I think that with Sonos, it's a bit easier to find music and radio stations and to start them up. I manage with Yamaha, I'm also still learning. What's great about Yamaha though, I can use MusicCast without creating an account and giving all my data to some big company in Trumpland. My data is with enough big companies in Trumpland as it is. Also, if Sonos ever goes bankrupt, it's probably time for you to throw all 16 Sonos devices in the ashtray and... Go to your bank, they will give you some credits to buy new devices. But in Trumpland, they don't care about the environment. And they do everything on their credit card. So I guess this fits their culture better. But with Music Cost, because I can use it without creating or logging in to any sort of account. Even if Yamaha goes bankrupt, I'll still be able to use my Music Cost devices for as long as I have some old phone that I can run the MusicCast app on, which is definitely a big advantage. I think I agree with what you said about streaming vinyl to multiple speakers. It doesn't make much sense, but I now have a great amplifier uh, to play vinyl on if I want to, and I can always stream it. Not sure if I'm going to do it, because yeah, then I might as well play it from the computer. Thank you so much, and talk soon. Let's go back to the question of the use of the word blind to mean something other than the absence of vision and someone who would prefer to remain anonymous chiming in on this. You mentioned that most blind people didn't mind blind references that would immediately, that would imply rather stupidity. I wonder if those who would be more offended might be those of us in the workforce. I'm retired now, but when employed, I constantly had to prove myself to others. So I am offended by references that equate blindness with stupidity or other negative connotations. I think one of the issues that you're raising is that if you are employed, many of us have faced experiences where we feel that we might not be able to get ahead in our work or maybe we haven't been given an assignment that we believe we are absolutely qualified to take on because of these negative perceptions of blindness. And I guess if you are out in the workforce, you're just more likely to see a few more people. So I understand the logic there. Hey, Jonathan, this is Vincent from the Netherlands. Last week, someone asked for an RSS reader on the Windows platform. I found one the other day uh, by accident, actually. I was just looking for a new RSS provider. I tried Inno Reader, that's spelled India November Oscar Reader. It's a service from Bulgaria or something, and it's just another RSS provider. Uh, like you, I was with the old reader for, for years, and that worked for some extent, and the website was, was very accessible, and uh, I used the usual RSS readers on iOS to, to uh, keep track of my RSS feeds. But um, now I've switched to Inno Reader to just to try it out. By accident, I found an application for Windows which acts as an RSS reader with that service. So I am 
uh, playing around now with my reader you can find it on the microsoft store and it is well i don't can't say it's totally accessible but it's it's usable to a great extent you can uh, easily view the titles of the the, the articles on your feeds you can uh, the, the folder implementation is just there is usable the only problem i'm having you won't know which feed you are uh, viewing actually until you open the article you what you want to read there is just a simple hotkey to open the article in that uh, little tool called my reader and it will pop up in your web browser works great and there is even for those who like to listen to their speech synthesizer even a listen button and the artic- article will be read out to you by the my reader app uh, as far as i know it's free it works with feedly the old reader they say they support but i can't get it to work and it works with inno reader and that's my rss provider of choice at the moment and you can as far as i saw you can also import just your, your local rss feeds into the tool so if you don't want to use a service who handles your rss feeds you'll be fine with that tool as well and you can just import your opml file with rss feeds into my reader and it'll be good to go Furthermore, I would love to hear from you what you are using these days for your uh, read later service. I have a, a Pocket and uh, uh, Instapaper account, and I know you are a huge fan of Instapaper. And I wonder what makes Instapaper better than than Pocket or different than Pocket. It, to me, those services are very much the same. I don't, I don't see much differences. Maybe I'm, I'm overlooking something, and maybe it's your organi- uh, the, the organizing of your Instapaper that makes it great for you. Maybe you can tell something about how you uh, get it set up and organ- um, organized all your uh, read later articles. And it should be integratable with the Voice Dream Reader. I uh, tried that uh, and, and it worked for me for a long time, but I can't get it to work anymore. And I wonder, uh, maybe does someone know uh, how I can get my Insta paper back with Voice Dream Reader? I've toggled the switch a few times, but uh, no articles are imported to Voice Dream Reader. So wonder what's going on there. Maybe someone can shed a little light on that. Nice to hear from you from the sunny Netherlands, Vincent. I presume it's sunny at this time of year. And thank you for the RSS reader recommendation. It's nice to know there's something of value on the Windows Store. Sorry to sound cynical, but I think from an accessibility point of view, the Windows Store is a bit of a wasteland. I don't think that Microsoft for all of its trumpeting of accessibility, and rightfully so. They've done a lot of good work in accessibility. I just don't think that many of these so-called modern apps are particularly nice to use with a screen reader, so it's good to know that you've found one that's almost there. Regarding Read Later services, and let me just step back a little bit and talk about these for those who are not familiar with them, so we can try and take people along with us on this journey. The idea of a Read Later service is that if you come across an article when you're scanning your news, and Vincent and I clearly both use RSS readers as our primary source of news, but you could easily do this with Twitter. I would not dream of using Facebook for news, but I guess some people do, and I presume this works the same way. You sometimes come across an article that you don't have time to read right now, and you think, I really want to read this, or perhaps you want to save it. I did used to use Instapaper quite a lot, for preparing for this show, actually. But now I have a different workflow that involves Ulysses. But you can save these articles and read them later. Now, some browsers also have reading list features. Safari has it, other web browsers have them too, where you can save articles for later using the reading list. My reason for sticking with Instapaper historically has been that Instapaper is an accessible app. You can make it read articles to you so you can sort of sit back, relax and enjoy a playlist of news stories, which is quite good. It also integrates well with Voice Dream Reader. I was interested in Pocket when they came out some time ago now with that really big revamp. I think it was pretty much like a rewrite of Pocket from the ground up. And one of the things that they boasted was a soup drinker skill for Pocket. And I thought that would be really cool if you could have your soup drinker read to you different articles from your read it later service. So I did investigate Pocket. When I did so, I found that the iOS Pocket app left a lot to be desired compared with the clean just get on with it and do it, accessible user interface of Instapaper. Instapaper isn't perfect, though. I'd like to see some implementation of the actions rotor there. 
so that it's much easier to delete articles. But yes, I do have different folders set up on Instapaper so I can file articles away based on different criteria. And I haven't, to be fair, checked out the iOS Pocket app for a while. And it may be that they've responded to feedback and that Pocket is much better with VoiceOver than it was when I last checked it out. I know there was a period there, Vincent, where Instapaper users were able to get Voice Dream Reader access without having to pay for the premium service. And I think that period may have ended. That could possibly be what's going on. So I think it's possible that like other third-party apps, if you want to integrate Instapaper with it, it's possible you have to pay for the subscription, which is like $3 a year or something really minimal like that. Because I know Instapaper has changed hands a few times and it's possible that that's the situation now. So good luck and the Read Later services are great to investigate. Hi, Jonathan. This is Colin Gallagher. I wanted to comment on something that was mentioned in episode 46 of the podcast. It was when you were talking about NFC and you mentioned about using your phone as a hotel key instead of a key card. I thought I would quickly talk about my experience with this because I've actually done this. I have experience with Hilton and I really like it. So one of the things you can do even before the digital key experience is you can do mobile check-in. And one of my favorite things about mobile check-in is you get to check in at 6 a.m. the day before your trip. So if you're checking in on a Saturday, you can check in through the app on Friday at 6 a.m. or anytime after that. And you can pick your exact room. Like you can look at what's available and pick down even to the room number and floor. So if you decide you want as high up as you can get, you can pick that out. And during that process, you can select if you want digital key or not. I've gotten the digital key a few times just to try it. And it works very well with voiceover. Because I'm sure some of you were curious about how well it worked with voiceover. And it is quite good. I'm actually going to insert here a very short clip of how it works that I recorded as a part of a YouTube video on my channel back in October at a Hilton Garden Inn in Freeport, Maine. So this is a short clip of me unlocking my room using digital key with voiceover on my iPhone XR. Travel folder, 12 apps. Travel, heading, Hilton Honors. So I'm gonna open my Hilton Honors app. Hilton Honors. Stay one of two selected. Select Hilton Garden in Freeport downtown. Okay, that's the stay. Confirmation up hotel in location map. Button call hotel. Share state. Hotel fit. Digital key ready to use. Button. Now it's a digital key is ready to use. So I'll double tap this. Close digital key. Digital key. Home sweet home. Home sweet home. That's what I named the room. Tap to unlock. And tap to unlock if I double tap this. Unlocking. Unlocking. Oh, my friends. And it is unlocked. So that is a very quick demo of how that works and you'll notice that the room was labeled in my app as home sweet home because I personally consider a hotel home when I travel but what it'll ask you to do after you unlock the door for the first time is it will ask you if you'd like to hide your room number for security reasons and I had done so at that point and you could enter a name for the room at least here in the US it seems to be available at nearly every Hilton hotel I've stayed at. Now, I don't think this works with as NFC. I think it's actually potentially Bluetooth LE, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But I'd be curious to know if you've used a solution like this at a hotel, what you thought of it. And also, I'd like to know, are we starting to be excited about the virtual summer conventions? I know ACB is going on now. And NFB starts July 14th, and I'm getting super pumped for NFB this year. So I'm curious to know which conventions, if any, 
our listeners are attending. And that's what I have for this week. Keep up the great podcasts and stay safe. Thank you, Cullen. And that was a cool demo. That was a cool one. And I have not used one of these keys before, so you're living the dream. That does sound very, very cool, and I hope that that continues to expand all over the place because it beats fossicking around for your key, and then, you know, you may have got up to your hotel room uh, ready to perhaps um, get acquainted with the with the porcelain there, you know, and um, you find that your key – has um, erased itself and you can't unlock the door. Horrible thing. And you have to go all the way down there, uh, trying to find perhaps a convenience on the way. <laughs> and, oh, it's awful. So, so to have that on your phone is just so convenient. And I think it is exciting, actually, this business with the conventions going virtual, because a lot of people are intimidated about going, perhaps because they just don't know if they have the skills. And, you know, I accept that that's also a confidence building thing, that as long as The right assistance is available and no one's judging. It can be a big confidence booster. But most significantly, a lot of people just don't have the money to do it. So to democratize the conventions in this way, I think is very exciting. And it will be interesting to see how it all goes. Hi, Jonathan Ibrahim Khalil from Boston. I know a couple of high fidelity MP3 players uh, use Android uh, for the systems. Um, These are players like Walkman that can play high fidelity music or lossless music. And I'm wondering uh, with the new update to Android 11, um, if they will be accessible with TalkBack um, because they're using Android. Because I'd love to get one of these new um, high fidelity players to play Tidal, Hi-Fi, or Diva Hi-Fi on. Um, that sounds much better than a phone probably is what I'm hearing. Um, second question is, um, I checked out the Samsung Smart Things app, and I'm wondering, is that only for the TV, or can you use it for other Samsung devices? And uh, finally, you mentioned a couple of years ago that you use a Wibbings or Wibings uh, House Mate Connect app and Scale, and I'm wondering if those are still accessible and if they become more accessible or that couple of years gone by because I'm looking forward to get a smart scale that will connect with Apple Health Kit. Well, good to hear from you, Ibrahim. Regarding your Android device question, I guess that depends on the device manufacturer. I do hope we will talk at length at some point in a future episode that the Peloton bikes now have talkback built in. So I think it would be up to the manufacturer of each of these players to include talkback in their firmware. That said... It's not the case that with Deezer, you can listen to Deezer Hi-Fi on the iOS app at the moment, but you can listen to Tidal Hi-Fi. So if you want the good quality sound, you can just download the Tidal app to your iPhone and subscribe to the plan that includes Hi-Fi, and you will get really good sound. Now, whether you will be able to hear the difference between the premium digital analog converters that are in these Android players And what the iPhone has, I really would be quite skeptical about that. Uh, Neil Young came a cropper in this regard when he invested a lot of his money into this proprietary device that he'd developed. And he said that the digital analog converters were so much better and everybody will just swoon when they hear it. And very few people did. And now that thing has gone. So you may just want to try Tidal Hi-Fi on an iPhone with some good headphones. I mean, uh, some really good headphones. And of course, the digital analog converter there will be important as well. On to your second question regarding SmartThings. SmartThings is an ecosystem. It's a competitor to HomeKit. And so some appliances will be SmartThings compatible. And so, yes, you can do a lot more than just the TV. I personally don't bother because we're very much steeped in the Apple ecosystem. Our priority order is, first, we would really prefer things to work with HomeKit. If we can't do that, we'll have it work with the soup drinker. But we're not really interested in getting into the whole smart things business. And regarding the HealthMate app, the HealthMate app's accessibility has improved markedly in the last couple of years. I still have that same with things smart scale. And there are better ones out there now. I don't know what setup of the new Withings Smart Scale is like, but I really do like it. I uh, get on the scale every morning. It just transmits my weight data to 
with things, and then that means uh, it's available to me not only in their HealthMate app, but also in the Apple Health app. So it's a nice experience. An email from Imke who says here is some input regarding Google Meet and Google Docs, both of which were discussed on Mosin at Large within the last few weeks. In general, for information on using Google Apps with screen readers, I recommend the tutorial by Mystic Access, which is at www.mysticaccess.com. And there's a product link in the show notes that we will put there. It's a nice long link. But if you go to mysticaccess.com, I'm sure you'll be able to drill down and find it. Imke says, for Google Docs in particular, it provides information on some important settings that can make or break your experience. I used to think I couldn't use Google Docs with NVDA, but with these settings in place, it works like a charm for me under Windows 10. It did not work as well under Windows 7. Regarding joining a Google Meet from iOS, I do so either by opening the Google Meet app and choosing the appropriate events from the list that appears there, or by clicking on the link in the reminder email that comes from my Google Calendar. I find the Google Meet app itself to be accessible, except that, as in other such apps, I have no access to the contents of a shared screen. On a separate note, I downloaded Fantastical following your recent recommendation. I am wondering if there are any tutorials for using it or whether you might consider giving one in one of your upcoming shows. For example, I have not found a button for creating a new event. Oh, my word. Well, I mean, if we're talking that basic, yeah, uh, let's just quickly cover that, and I might come back to Fantastical sometime later. Open Fantastical. Now, bear in mind that I have set Fantastical. this up, and Fantastical has now loaded. I've set this up, so I'm logged in with my Flexibit account. Alistair and Jonathan, weekly catch up. Microsoft there we go. Weekly. And I have added my different calendars that I use, particularly my Microsoft Exchange, one for work and iCloud. They're all set up. And I'm going to perform a four-finger tap to go to the bottom of the screen. New event button. There it is. New event. I'll double tap. Create event. Text field. Is editing. Character mode. Insertion point at start. And right here, a sentence to create a new event. I'm in an edit field. Words. And the voiceover hint is just fantastic. The voiceover support in general in this app is just fantastic. Because you heard the hint right there. Type a sentence to create a new event. So this is not just your standard Apple hint for the edit field. It's telling you to type a sentence to create a new event. So now I could say... Meet with Imkey at 8 a.m. tomorrow, and then my calendar is all populated with the fields. Simple as that. And I'm happy to come back to Fantastical sometime later, but it is a really good app. To contribute to Mosin at Large, you can email Jonathan, that's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, at mushroomfm.com by writing something down or attaching an audio file. Or you can call our listener line, it's a US number, 864-60-MOSIN. That's 864-606-6736. Mosin at Large.